Well, hello. Uh, this is uh, live from almost live, uh, getting uh, getting over a long cold, and uh, but I think one of the virtues of uh, having a habit is that it draws you to continue. So, if your habit is getting up and writing every day, or getting up early and writing every day, or staying up late and writing every day, anything that you commit yourself to doing, you'll find yourself drawn to doing it. So no matter how sick I am right now, uh, not contagious, uh, lucky you, um, uh, it, I'm inspired to uh, continue to do these Writing Wednesdays. Um, so even in my jammies. <laughs> so uh, thank you for tuning in. And I thought I'd do something a little bit different today. I've been th reading a lot of poetry. I had a poetry reading last night uh, at uh, the local bookstore, uh, Stories, with a fantastic poet named Mandy Kahn, who invited me to um, read the poetry uh, from uh, my novel, uh, The Revolution of Marina M. I've never done that before. Uh, I never think of myself as a poet. I think of my characters as poets, and these are, this is their poetry. So uh, I, I've had a lot of, I think a lot about the poets, as you all know, uh, pretty frequently, and um, <laughs> and uh, I can see your comments going by. <laughs> I love this. Um, and uh, what I thought I would do is read a couple of my favorite poems about writing. So the first one, and then you don't have to look at me in my red nose. Uh, so let's turn this around. First one is always the first one, is Dylan. Uh, you all know that he's my very favorite poet. And this is his poem uh, called... Um, I'll just prop him up here so you don't have to look at me. There we go. Is that good? That's a little close. Yeah, let's try that. Okay, he's probably going to fall over, but <laughs> I'm sure he did that plenty in life, too. Um, but this is a very famous poem called In My Craft or Sullen Art. In my craft or sullen art, exercised in the still night, when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms, I labor by singing light, not for ambition or bread or the strut and trade of charms on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these sp spindrift pages, not for the towering dead with their... Whoa! <laughs> Whoa, you just took a tumble. <laughs> I knew it would fall over eventually. Um, not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these spindrift pages, not for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay, pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. I mean, that is about the selflessness of writing, that who are you writing for, you know? Uh, we're not doing it just to... Um, uh, goof around, spend some time. Uh, um, I, I can think of many rude um, images that I'm going to skip right now. Um, but we're doing it, what are we doing it for? Uh, we're doing it for people who are carrying their griefs and their sorrows and living their lives. And even if they, you know, any particular person doesn't read it, uh, that's the level on which... Um, Dylan is saying that's what we, uh, that's where we create our art. And uh, it's a wonderful poem and very interesting to see the rhymes. Um, when you're writing, be aware of the sounds, the chimes. Uh, there's something about words that rhyme that tell the brain that these 
makes sense. It's a, a logic that is a logic of sound, and you hear it. Great orators, uh, God, listen to Jesse Jackson uh, make a speech. The great orators, often great preachers, um, use rhyme to bring their thoughts together. I mean, even as stupid as, you know, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Um, there's something about those little chimes, and he doesn't do it throughout, but he saves it for on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Um, I do it for the lovers, their arms round the grief of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. Okay, so there's one. And then one of my very, another very favorite, and I won't make the mistake of trying to prop the book up because um, that seems to be uh, a dangerous thing that causes the phone to do backflips. But I'll turn it around so you can see the book. And one of my very favorite poets, Anne Sexton, her complete poems. And she has a poem called The Black Art in which she describes her uh, take on writing. And I adore this poem to distraction, The Black Art. And I've heard her reading it. If you can ever hear it, hear her read it, that's also Dylan. Uh, these are people who really have, uh, they have a voice both on the page and in the ear. The Black Art. A woman who writes feels too much. Those trances and portents, as if cycles and children and islands weren't enough, as if mourners and gossips and vegetables were never enough. She thinks she can warn the stars. A writer is essentially a spy. Dear love, I am that girl. A man who writes knows too much. Such spells and fetishes as if erections and congresses and products weren't enough, as if machines and galleons and wars were never enough. With used furniture he makes a tree. A writer is essentially a crook. Dear love, you are that man. Never loving ourselves, hating even our shoes and our hats, we love each other, precious, precious. Our hands are light blue and gentle. Our eyes are full of terrible confessions. But when we marry, the children leave in disgust. There is too much food and no one left over to eat up all the weird abundance. <laughs> so that's from Anne Sexton's, and she has several more about writing. You know, obviously poets especially, they think a lot about their art and how they're creating it. Um, then I was, right now I'm searching for a title for book number two of Revolution of Marina M. So I'm reading all my Russians uh, very heavily. And uh, I'm one of the great poems about the writing is a short one by, um, by Anna Khmatova. And when you have books in translation, when you are, are, have poets in translation, it's often really interesting to read more than one translation because uh, you're hearing a poem through as, as understood or interpreted by one person. So it's not like Dylan and then a Dylan cover and then another Dylan cover because you can't really understand the first Dylan. Imagine Dylan was in Chinese. And then somebody would cover that song in English in a different way, and a different way, in a different way. They're all different. None of them are Dylan. The same thing with reading poetry and translation, um, especially short poems. <laughs> They're very tight, very intricate. So I have a couple of different uh, Akhmatavas that I like. Um, but I'll show you the one that has a nice picture of her, so you can look at her. So there's a beautiful, uh, complete Akhmatova 
Uh, there she is. Uh, she was my character's uh, idol and the idol of many girls Marina's age. And then here's her take on her muse. And she writes about her muse several times. Uh, but this is, the f this is the famous one. It's just called M Muse. When in the night I wait for her arrival, my life seems hanging by the smallest hair. For what are honors, youth, freedom, survival, when such a guest, Pan's pipe in hand, is there? And here she enters, unveiled. She engages me with her eyes most scrutinizingly. I speak to her. You gave Dante the pages of the Inferno. And she answers, me. So that is taking it on. You know, she's not apologizing. She's not saying, oh, this is just a little thing I do. You know, she is stepping up uh, to be in the ranks of the greats. And um, all of her, and her poems to the muse, they're often the sister muse. Um, so it's like looking at herself in a mirror. Uh, but this one is definitely saying, Parnassus has arrived, um, and that's laying down the gauntlet. And other poem, poets respond. Um, one thing that's very interesting as a writer, and not necessarily a poet, but if you have a, a writer that you really, really admire, there's a couple things you can do. You can pretend that you're not overwhelmed by that person, that they're not sitting on your head, that you're not thinking about them all the time. Um, and we're talking about the greats, you know. Uh, it's like, how can I be any good when X, Joyce, lives in the world? How can I be any good when whoever is sitting on my head uh, it lives in the world? Then you get a poet like, uh, like uh, Marina Tsvetaeva. There she is. Oh, my God. She is the firebrand. What a fabulous, fabulous poet. And this is a very nice edition, um, uh, Penguin Classics. And, hey, um, I, see, I see everybody's feed coming up. It's very funny. Hi, Azrin. So Tataeva dealt in a certain way with the people that she she idolizes, but she also has to get in there, you know. She is a major, major poet, and she's very serious about being part of the canon herself. So how does she deal with that, uh, her feeling? Also, Akhmatova was a tremendous beauty, as you'd seen before. People had paintings of her, and she was very cultured and came from, uh, um, she was lauded in her circle, and she very, um, very graceful and charming person, and and Sataeva was all elbows. She was she was extremely passionate. She was the kind of person who was setting fire to the curtains. You know, it's like, what do you do with Marina Sataeva? But she was, you know, she was one of the greats. And here is Akhmatova standing on her head. So she wrote a poem called po Poems for Akhmatova. Okay, so watch what she does in praising her her literary goddess poems for Akhmatova so there are three of them this is like this is a very interesting way of dealing with your heroes and uh, keeping them keeping them uh, from standing on your head first she praises her uh, as all good poets should do a muse of lament, you are more the most beautiful of all muses, a crazy emanation of white night, which is the summers in Petersburg. Uh, and you have sent a black, era, a black snowstorm over all Russia. We are pierced with the arrows of your cries, so that we shy like horses at the muffled, many times uttered pledge, ah, Anna Akhmatova, the name is a vast sigh, and it falls into depths without name, and we wear crowns only through stamping the same earth as you, with the same sky over us. Whoever shares the pain of your deathly power will lie down immortal upon his deathbed. In my melodious town, she's from Moscow, 
So she's saying, okay, so Lachmatova's up there in the north, in Petersburg. In my melodious town, the domes are burning, and the blind wanderer praises our shining Lord. I give you my town of many bells, Akhmatova, and with the gift, my heart. So, in a way, she's saying, you don't have Moscow. It's mine. It's mine to give you. I'm, I'm giving it to you, but it's not yours by right. <laughs> Sneaky. Two. I stand, head in my hands, thinking how unimportant are the traps we set for one another. Oh, yeah, what traps are those? I hold my head in my hands as I sing in this late hour in the late dawn, and how violent is this wave which has lifted me up on its crest. I sing of one that is unique among us as the moon is alone in the sky. So I sing. I sing. I still have a voice here. Uh, and who is unique, unique among us as the moon is alone in the sky, that has flown into my heart like a raven, has speared into the clouds, hook nose, she had a, uh, Akhmatova had a bump on her nose, hook nose with deathly anger, even your favor is dangerous. For you have spread out your night over the pure, pure gold of my Kremlin, my Kremlin itself, your favor is dangerous. Uh, there we go. I have tightened and have tightened my throat with the pleasure of singing as if with a strap. Like you're choking me. Ah, oh, yes, I am happy. The dawn never burnt with more purity. I'm happy to give away everything to you and to go away like a beggar. You think she's going to? Uh, uh. For I was the first to give you, whose voice, deep darkness, has constricted the movement of my breathing, the name of the Tsar Tsarskolsky Muse. She's from Tsarsky Solo, uh, Akhmatova. So she's calling her the Muse from Tsarsky Solo. The, the name of the Tsarsky Sarsko Selsky Muse. I am a convict. You won't fall behind. You are my guard. Our fate is therefore one, and in that emptiness that we both share, the same command to ride away is given. And now my demeanor is calm, and now my eyes are without guile. Won't you set me free, my guard, and let me walk now towards that pine tree? You block out everything, even the sun at its highest. Hold all the stars in your hand. If only through some wide open door I could blow like the wind to where you are, and starting to stammer, suddenly blushing, could lower my eyes before you and fall quiet in tears as a child sobs to receive forgiveness. I mean, there are some very complicated feelings about one poet um, to her um, more um, favored uh, idol, rival, complex relationship. And uh, they, I don't believe, she wanted to meet, but I don't believe Akhmatova uh, met her ever met her. Uh, they stayed in their own spheres, although they knew a lot of people in common. Uh, this was like a poetic thing. And Marina Tsutayeva uh, writes about a lot of the poets of the time. So they become a conversation. You realize, oh my God, all these people knew each other. And what's great about Tsutayeva, she wrote poems about every one of them. And so did Akhmatova, but they're a little bit more disguised. Uh, then... Um, there is Bela Ahmudlina. And there she is. Uh, and she was sort of in the, um, the poets of the, what I call sort of the, the beat generation. Uh, she was married to Yevtushenko, uh, another poet, Vosnesiensky, a very uh, fine poet. They kind of were the generation of the 60s. And they were sort of official, but they always kind of skirted that line 
uh, definitely were not in the kind of danger that Akhmatova and uh, Satayeva and those guys were in. But she has a poem about being a poet, uh, being a writer, that is called uh, uh, A Fairy Tale About the Rain. And I read this from the 70s in Vogue magazine, and I still can't believe it. The Russians often, they have what they call verses, and then they have what they call poemi, which are long poems. And the fairy tale about the rain in that book, The Garden, which is bilingual for those who have some Russian but not enough, like myself. Um, And the rain is the poet's calling. Uh, It's a representation of this sodden rain that keeps following this woman around and she gets invited to a fancy party and she wants to be part of it and there's the rain drenching the carpet and making a mess. She tries to ditch her in a cafe. She's trying to get away from the rain. But she's still, she just, whenever she stops for a moment, back that rain comes. But I had been invited to a home where people waited to give me formal welcome, where above the amber lake of the parquet flooring a chandelier rose as clearly as the moon. I thought and thought, what can I do with rain? Obviously it's not about to leave. It'll track the floor, it'll soak the rugs. If I bring it along, they'll never let me in. So she tries to get her to stay out, but Rain looked at me with two big orphan eyes. Oh, damn you, the hell with it. Come on, I said. But why have you been poured on me? It's like, how did this happen? Um, So honored, here we come in, and we're drinking with the guests, and we're so happy. And Rain, half hiding up and down my spine, was tickling, breathing morosely down my neck. First steps, the peephole, silence, then the latch. I apologized at once. This rain is mine. Excuse me, may it stay on the porch, perhaps? It's much too wet and much too long, strung out for any room. And the host, of course, had no idea what she was talking about, because this is bureaucracy. These are fancy people. This is the apparatus. This is the biz. This is why I don't talk talk about the writing business because it has no business. The rain comes in with you. Your need to do this, um, it, as uncomfortable as it is, as unsightly as it is, as, you know, it doesn't mean to be so demanding, but uh, it's, you can't get rid of it. It's part of the process. I really liked that house, I must admit. There, easy lightness danced its own ballet. No corners bruised your elbow on your way. No finger worried about knives cutting it. The lady of the house was, you know, how do you do? Just was lovely. And then she declared, I have a bone to pick. For heaven's sakes, you're so very talented. Out in the rain and such a dreadful distance. And everyone said, to the fire, quick. So they try to dry off. Into the fire alive, for everything, for rain, for afterwards, for the magic pair of blackest eyes, for sounds flying through air, the like bird cherry pits from the lips, not caring where. And suddenly I noticed that my faithful rain was standing all alone outside the window crying. Two huge tears welled up in my eyes, the only trace that it had been left behind. I mean, this is such a beautiful poem. Oh, my God. You know, obviously can't read it to you, but... um, She finally comes back together with... uh, with the rain. Rain bent my lips down towards her hand. I wept, forgive me, please. Your eyes are clear and pure and very wise. And the hostess heats up the fire and gives her cognac, and she, it, it's pretty nice, but, uh, but the rain, you know, she needs that rain. It's a beautiful poem, and uh, I recommend it highly, but obviously I'm not going to uh, read it here.
Then there is this wonderful book that is hard to find. Um, but uh, now that with the internets, uh, it is fairly easy to find things that are hard to find. This is an artist book. And if you read anything about the publishing house artists, it has a fascinating history. Um, and this is Modern Russian Poets on Poetry. And it has them in their own words, their own writings. Uh, their, this book I've just treasured over the years. And um, they're, I'll just read you a tiny bit from Pasternak called Some Statements. Okay, so what I like about this Pasternak, uh, oh my God. Contemporary trends of thought imagine that art is like a fountain, where it's a sponge. They have decided that art should gush forth, whereas it should absorb and become saturated. They think it can be broken down into methods of depiction, where it is composed of organs of perception. The proper task of art is to be always an observer, to gaze more purely than others do, more receptively and faithfully. But in our time, it has become acquainted with powder and the makeup room and displays itself from the stage as if there were two kinds of art in the world uh, and one of them, having the other in reserve, can permit itself the luxury of self-distortion a luxury equivalent to suicide. It shows itself off, whereas it ought to be sunk in obscurity in the back rows, hardly aware that its hat is a flame on its head, or that, though it is hidden away in the corner, it is stricken with a phosphorescence and light transparency, as with some kind of illness. And this is my very favorite. A book is a cubic piece of burning, smoking, a, a, cu a book is a cubic piece of burning, smoking conscience and nothing else. Mating calls are the care nature takes to preserve the feathered species, her vernal ringing in the ears. A book is like a wood grouse calling in the spring, deafened with its own sound, living, listening spellbound to itself. It hears nothing and nobody. Without it, the spiritual race would have had no continuation. It would become extinct. M monkeys had no books. A book is written. It grows. It gathers experience. It knocks about the world. And now it's grown up. And this is what it is. It is not to blame for the fact that we can see right through it. That's how spiritual universe is arranged. Yet not very long ago, the scenes in a book were thought to be dramatization. This is wrong. What should it want them for? People forgot that the only thing which lies in our power is to know how not to distort the voice of life that sounds within us. The inability to find and tell the truth is a deficiency that cannot be covered up by any amount of ability to tell untruths. A book is a living being. It is quite conscious and in its right mind. Pictures and scenes are what it has brought out of the past and committed to memory and is not prepared to forget. Wow. Okay. So these are all kind of uh, inspirational. Like what what writing is to writers. Um, and uh, I find these are uh, so, so fine. Here is a good question. Um, do you speak and read Russian? Mm, well enough to read a bilingual edition. Uh, can you say whether the translations convey the spirit of the poems? Translations can either can do many things, but remember it's always a voice of a cover artist. So in trying to understand the song, it's best to hear a number of different cover artists. You probably can listen to the original and hear the music of the rhymes uh, on YouTube or something, uh, but you can't 
you'll have to kind of take your favorite of the translations, whatever seems most appealing to you. Uh, I, I'm a great believer in that. Uh, let's see. I have... Uh, I had a question from Jeffrey that was really good, and uh, I wanted to, I wrote it down so I could answer. Jeffrey wanted to ask me about writing, to talk about writing about music uh, in my books, like the band Lola Lola in uh, Painted Black. Uh, sometimes are more musical than others. Um, I use in Marina M in uh, uh, the Russian Revolution, songs tended to be um, from the last century. Uh, people, it was opera, they were folk songs, the popular songs uh, of the day. Um, and there was starting to be gramophone recordings. So I do use music um, to set a mood uh, my characters dance the tango, which is exactly what they're doing. Um, and me and Amor Noche was the one of the early tangos that had been recorded by Carlos Gardel. Um, music gives you the feel of a t of time and place and mood. So if your characters are in a bar and you want to have some music, pick something that either picks up the mood or that comments on the action between the characters and it can either comment directly or it can reverse so if the characters are having uh, uh, romantic problems maybe it's a romantic song it just makes everything worse um, so it's either it's again comment on the scene, it can set a mood. The important thing is that you describe it and not just name name check it. Uh not just uh uh Stormy Monday on the stereo. You develop you need this is another thing for your notebooks. Listen to music and can you describe Stormy Monday? Can you describe Billy Holiday's voice? Can you describe Ella Fitzgerald's voice? Can you describe uh I don't know, Tom Waits's voice, probably. Uh and do you have any ability to talk about music? Uh do you have can you develop, you need to develop your vocabulary. Like what does a woodwind instrument sound like? What does an oboe sound like? What does this, what is that guy doing on the guitar? What is Hendrix doing on the guitar in All on the Watchtower? Can you describe that so that a deaf person could enjoy? Uh, because you have to write for 50 years ahead. So I, I write 50 years ahead and that's probably just as, um, arrogant as uh, Akhmatova thinking that the muse of Dante is coming to her. But, you know, you got to you got to write to your best. You got to got to lift your sights. And in 50 years will they understand what that song is? If you give it us, you know, a bit of a description, people will understand what you're saying. Um so don't just uh, name a song, but remember, but see if you can get your musical vocabulary together so that you can actually describe the textures of song, the flavors, um, as well as actual technical terms. So uh, let's see. One other thing that I wanted to show you, seeing we're sort of doing show and tell today, is when I assign... Uh, work on character, developing character. Um, I give people a huge list of things that they could find out about their character and write up, or not their character, but people, and write up in their notebooks so that when they want to describe a character, give the character unique traits, they have a lot of work already done. And one of the things I had uh, asked uh, a class to do is to write up superstitions. What are some superstitions? Not only real ones, but but um, but fake ones. Superstitions. 
What are bad omens that somebody might see? Here is some a whole book of phobias. These this is a student. This was her assignment. The assignment was to gather them, and she actually made little books, which I still keep. I love them. Elizabeth Iglese, thank you. Uh, so she the list of she just went through a list of different kinds of phobias. Fear of horses, you know. The, I'm not so interested in the names of these things, equinophobia, uh, eremophobia, but the phenomena are perfect because what, you know, what kind of idiosyncras idiosyncrasies are you giving your characters? Fear of horses, fear of being oneself or of one or of loneliness, fear of blushing, fear of work or functioning. A surgeon's fear of operating, the fear of work, the fear of sexual love or sexual questions. I mean, you can, you think of that, you're already having a character. You're already thinking of a story, uh, what's going on here. Omens are fabulous. can always have a character see something not good. So, um, like, what does breaking a mirror mean? Breaking a mirror means seven years of bad luck, unless you take the pieces outside and bury them in moonlight. See, it doesn't have to be real. It just has to be imaginative. Also, an undisturbed mirror in a house suddenly falls and smashes, then it means that there will soon be a death. Well, you use that all day long. Uh, so she did a list of bad omens that are traditional, and then she started tripping out and doing uh, bad, you know, new shoes should never be left on a table. I mean, that's a made-up one, but why not? You know, your mother said new shoes or something will happen. Uh, and the superstitions, the... Uh, uh, every culture has its superstitions. Um, but it's also a character can make up superstitions. Um, you can make up superstitions for your character. Uh, I think it's interesting, especially the more rational the character, the more interesting it is when there are certain things that they won't do. Uh, because man is not a rational animal. So to have a very rational person who nevertheless you know, won't have a shave uh, on Friday or, uh, you know, totally not superstitious, but does not like the black cat. You know, little things like that. Uh, they can be residual, culturally residual. Uh, uh, in I'm Jewish, in our culture, my God, my grandmother. So many superstitions. Oh, and they're not traditional, but they're things like she had a shop. You know, her husband had a shop. Uh, her son worked there. And uh, and uh, the neighbor lady brought a plant. They had, I think they'd re recently moved or remodeled or something. And the neighbor lady in the next office brought uh, this plant for her flowers. And she was so nice and blah, blah, blah. I had no idea. As soon as that woman left, she took that plant and she took it outside. <laughs> she said, never take a gift from someone who doesn't like you. Very interesting. So super, you know, these are all things that, that help you examine character and, and so on. So uh, if anybody has any questions, oh, here's Bazarov's mother in Fathers and Sons has a long list of superstitions. It's always a good thing to give your characters superstitions. Uh, I, I Give them facial irregularities, especially if they're good looking. You know, give them a scar, give them a chipped tooth, you know, give them one ear higher than the other or something they might be slightly self-conscious about. Everybody has something. And if you have a, an unappealing character, give them something beautiful. You know, he's a toad, but he has the most beautiful hands, you know, or he has, she's, you know, kind of a wreck, but, but you know, her nose is perfection. Uh so that's always interesting to do. So I will wrap this up unless people have uh, any questions that I can ask. And I'll go take some more uh, uh, NyQuil or DayQuil or whatever the heck I'm doing here. 
Uh, and uh, I hope that you uh, find inspiring, inspiring things. Listen to the writers, listen to the poets, and address your idols. Uh, you can do that as a uh, in short stories, if, as a fiction writer. If say the character, the writer sitting on your head is James Joyce. You know, let's get a big, heavy person sitting on your neck. Well, you can talk to James Joyce. You can look at his, take one of his scenes and uh, play with it. You know, do something to have a conversation with that uh, style. You can try the style and have a conversation with it. Find a way to, you know, wear the skin of a lion a little bit. Uh, and that's an interesting transference and, uh, and well-worn. Uh, explain your own character, or your own world, to Melville. You know, you'll recognize this. Uh, so don't avoid the agony of influence. You know, make it conscious and confront it. Deal with it. So thank you very much, and uh, hopefully I'll be much better next week. Okay, bye-bye.